Welcome to Conversations in Color, a weekly series committed to open, honest conversation and exploring hard questions regarding race and racism in Western Wisconsin and beyond. Here is your host, Ed Hudgens. Well, hello there, and welcome to Conversations in Color, the virtual edition. It's a totally uh, different vibe for us. Usually we're doing this at the Pablo Center in downtown Eau Claire, and now we are doing it from various locations around Eau Claire uh, because of that dumb COVID thing. But uh, I'm so glad that you're listening in. We're excited about uh, this week's show. Um, after taking a couple weeks off here, we're going to dive into something that is uh, really uh, for me personally, I, th- I find to be a really important dynamic. But before we get into that, um, just a reminder, Conversations in Color um, is an effort for us to create space for us to come together and talk about hard stuff, talk about race, racial issues, racial injustice, and, um, and work through things together. Um, and with this particular uh, uh, platform, that we have here, we, we, there are three types of, there are three pillars basically to the ways, the way that we want to do these conversations. Um, first of all, we want to, we are going to uh, practice humility, recognizing that as we walk into these conversations, there's a lot that we don't know, and we don't know nearly as much um, as we think we do sometimes, and we just, we're, we're going to own that overtly. Um, secondly is honesty. When we come into this, we're going to lean in on the hard stuff and not be afraid to ask hard questions and to think about hard things. And and when we don't know, be willing to, to admit it. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not least, is humanity. And we're going to we're going to honor the value and dignity um, of every person. Nobody's going to get vilified. Nobody's going to get degraded. That's not what we do here. This is about um, a value, valuing uh, human dignity and um I also want to mention really important. I should have mentioned this first, but this Conversations in Color, this series, all of this is brought to you by our friends at Uniting Bridges. You'll hear a little bit more about them in just a moment. Uh, The Pablo Center, who have been incredible partners and Converge Radio. So, uh, yeah, thank you for those three to those three groups for being such great partners and sponsors and facilitators of this event. So what I'd like to do now is introduce uh, our panelists for tonight. First up, I'm not sure if everybody sees everybody in the same way that I see them, but Tanya Hughes is in the middle top of my screen. Hopefully hopefully she is for you as well. Uh, Tanya is a licensed counselor and she works with the Clinic for Christian Counseling here in Eau Claire. Uh, She's also a a local church leader. Um, And she also, by the way, is an adoptee and an adoptive parent. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in December when she joins us uh, for the December 14th show, which is also her birthday. And she said there has to be cake. So Tanya, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm I'm really glad to be here, Ed. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I should, full full disclosure, um, Tanya and Bob are a couple of my favorite people. So I I probably should mention that, that, that I really like them a lot. Um, Bob is next up. Bob is, uh, if he's, if you're looking at him the same way I am, way I am, he is on the bottom of the screen here and he's got hair in places that, I mean, there, it feels like it's mixed up a little bit. Um, but, but this is Bob Sunderland. And I will tell you that Bob is not here because of his educational or academic background or any of that stuff. He's here because he has an incredible story to tell. Um, and we're going to, we're going to talk to him about that over the course of the show here. He's a good dude. And uh, Bob, I'm really glad that you're here, man. I appreciate it a lot. Thanks for having me, Ed. I'm I'm glad to be here tonight. Great. Great. And then we have my partner in crime. My partner in crime, who is also, I mean, that's her primary role is my partner in crime. Uh, But she is also a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, She is the president of Uniting Bridges. She is a general troublemaker at large, which is why we get along so well. This is Dr. Salika Ducksworth Lawton. Once again, welcome, Salika. Glad to be here. Hope to get into some good trouble. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) All right. And then my man, Adam Akala of CoLab fame. 
and also um, is a central part of this whole operation. Adam is here tonight. He's uh, going through us with us. Adam, would you talk, talk to us a little bit about what you're going to be doing tonight? Yeah, sure thing. I'm here, as always, focusing on community engagement. So if you have any questions for us, feel free to drop those in the chat. If you're not comfortable dropping them in the public chat, right-click my name, and you can private message me any questions that you might have. And this is a really important part. We want to know what our community wants to know about these various topics. So feel free to engage. Feel free to drop questions to the chat, and I'll make sure that we can um, intersperse as many of them as possible into the conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Adam, as always. Um, I'm just curious, do you have something to get us going in our conversation tonight? I do. I figured tonight, since we're talking about lament and it's kind of a heavy topic, I want to talk about what makes you happy. So that's the question, is what makes you happy? Um, kind of broad, and it could be a thing, it could be an experience, it could be a feeling, but um, what makes you happy? Ed, let's start with you. Well, I kind of want to I kind of want to harken back to a conversation that we had just before we went on the air here where we were talking about football uniforms. Um, and I would say like a football uniform where the colors really match up well um, and you don't have any kind of, you know, anyway, that's not what I'm going to say. Uh, I was giving Salika a hard time because she's a Saints fan and the gold on their helmet doesn't match with the uniforms. So <laughs> I would say. <clears throat> I would say what makes me happy, uh, boy, there's, there really are, there's a lot of stuff um, that make me happy, but I, I think I'm gonna go, happy seems like not the right word, but I'm gonna go with music. Um, it, it can make me happy. It's more about joy and, you know, and kind of fulfillment and um, satisfaction. So happy might not be the right word, but I, I'm gonna go with music. I don't know, Tanya, what, how about you? Oh, that's a big question. Lots of things make me happy, too. But I was thinking about just being outside and being in the sun and feeling the sun as you're doing whatever you're doing. Personally, I like water even better. Sun and water equals a double win. So that's, <laughs> that's my happy place. I like that. And can totally relate. Bob, how about you? Uh, what makes me happy is... Uh, um... That would be building and repairing or making something, whether it be in woodworking, automotive, 3D printing, doesn't matter. As long as I'm I'm not sitting idle. <laughs> but but building something, creating something, or fixing something. Creating, right? yeah, yeah. Creating something from nothing. Nice. Mm. I hear that. Salika, how about you? Um you know, besides my husband giving me a hug, because, you know, you're not happy when your spouse isn't happy. Uh, I, I need to make music. I need to play the piano or play the guitar um, or something probably once a day. My husband has said that he can tell when I haven't been practicing because I get cranky. <laughs> and he encourages me to go and uh, to practice. So I need to make music. Gotcha. All right, Adam. How about you? I see. I was thinking that I was going to say my dog Dexter, and that's another really good response because he's always so happy even when I'm not. But um, <laughs> I think something that a lot of people, especially performers, can sympathize with right now is applause. Hmm. And it's not a pain or narcissistic thing. It's a general collective experience of joy that then you feel as a performer upon getting applause. And mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that I, I miss a lot right now, but something that does make me very happy when, when we can perform and when we can enjoy things again together. Yeah, yep. I get that. I really probably should have mentioned something about live music, honestly, as being the kind of, the, but I, it's, you didn't ask what makes you happy that you really miss right now. <laughs> so. Uh, thank you, Adam. I appreciate that. And Adam, we'll check back in with you a little later um, in the show here and see what kind of questions and comments we're getting from the community. Um, so as Adam mentioned, uh, we're talking tonight about the idea of lament, and especially in the context of racial injustice. Um, the dictionary definition of lament is uh, to, feel, to feel, show, or express grief, sorrow, or regret. 
or to mourn deeply. So, you know, light stuff here. This is, a, <laughs> I'm glad that you started with the happy question. Um, yeah, we're talking about lament. You know, that's a, that's a good time, right? But it's important. Um, it's important because, um, and, and I would say uh, the reason we may think it's not so light and happy is because really as human beings, we have an aversion to discomfort, right? Um, we don't wanna be uncomfortable. And I would say, uh, and this is my uneducated opinion, but I would say even here in America, it may even be a little worse that we have a even stronger aversion to discomfort than other people in, in other places might. Um, and so, you know, lament, the idea of lamentation or grieving or feeling sorrow or regret, um, that is uncomfortable. But the truth of the matter is, if we're going to grow, discomfort is essential. Discomfort is a necessity. Um, and I think what I have learned, one of the big things I've learned over the years is there is a real strong relationship between lamentation and real change uh, in an individual, real behavioral change. There's a, there's a relationship between um, regretting something you've done deeply and then changing the way you live so that you're not doing that thing anymore. There's a connection there between that emotional, um, that emotional dynamic and then there's kind of this transaction that happens then in your behavior where you're all of a sudden you're not wanting to do that anymore because you don't want to feel that regret again, mm -hmm. regret again. You don't want to feel that sorrow. And so um, that's, that's why we want to focus on, on lamentation and this idea of lament when it comes to race issues is because there is this connection between uh, feeling grief and sorrow and regret and real behavior change. So with that in mind, um, can you guys talk, I, I would open this up to you all and ask you, and, and I'm not necessarily looking for clinical expertise or academic expertise here, but just your take on it. Um, how do you feel like lamentation and change are related? Like, how have you seen that or experienced it? Or um, how do you feel like just on an intellectual level, those things are related? And I will call on somebody. <laughs> People with that all the time. <laughs> well, so we could you know, kind of kick us off with what you think. <clears throat> you know, I've been thinking about the six principles of nonviolence all day. And the six principles of nonviolence come from the Sermon on the Mount. And I've been thinking about especially number two and number three and number four. Number two is nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. The end result of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. Number three is nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. Nonviolence recognizes that evildoers are also victims. And number four, I should say number five, is nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. Nonviolence is active, nonviolence is not passive. Nonviolence love does not seek to the level of the hater. Love restores community and resists injustice. And, and I've been thinking about nonviolence a lot, I'd say over the, the weekend, because as we try to move towards this beloved community, how do we restore relationships between people who have been hurt and people who cannot even see that they have hurt people. Mm -hmm. but also, how can we have people who are victims without re-victimizing them understand that the people who hurt you also need to be respected too? The, the person who is incarcerated, the person who is ex-incarcerated, the person 
who does not understand what they're doing. And I think this is the hardest part about nonviolence. It is to not dehumanize those who hurt you. And I think that's one of the hardest things about the Sermon on the Mount, too, for me as a um, as a person of faith. To, to hold on to not dehumanizing those who may not respect me. So when you're talking about lamentation, I think lamentation is a step to reconciliation. But it moves me towards... How do we reconcile? So then, uh, That's where I, I am at this point. No, that makes sense. And I'd be curious to hear what Tanya and Bob think about, about that, especially in relation to, you know, what is it about the, about the, the, the action or the idea of lamentation that can lead to that kind of change where you would seek reconciliation? Well, my definition or my observation of lamentations through my own uh, previous history, um, I've um, for a long time I didn't lament over anything. Um, and when I've decided to change my life and live a, as a better person, as a respectable member of society, uh, lamenting was one of the biggest things um, I had to do uh, that I had to recognize um, because I was the person that was doing the um, violence, the harm to mo most of the time. Um, and I didn't feel that I, 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 you know, I could lament over it, um, but through friends and community and church, um, I've come to realize that lamenting is the biggest thing to change, to reconciliation. Um, because if you lament properly, um, you will take responsibility for your actions, um, past, present, and future. Um, and that's, that's what I get from lamenting. Um, mm. It's just the focus on my responsibility. And you're speaking to that from your own personal experience. From, like my, that's, yeah. from my own personal experience, yes. Yeah. Tanya, how about you? I think of, like, I don't think, I think what you said earlier is right on. I don't think you can fully move forward without lamenting. Fully. I think it's a process. It's not like an, a one-time, I'm going to lament and I'm going to move on. It's a deep, cathartic, I'm lamenting this. And it's going to be a journey and I'm going to, New things are going to hit me every day that I have to lament, but I'm going to move forward in that lament. It's, there's, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do it either. I think you, you move through it. It's not, there's not a proper way to do it. It's, it's a process. Right. Which probably speaks a little bit to the discomfort we were talking about. If, mm -hmm. if it was more of a concrete, do this, do this, do this, um, and, and you just plug in the formula, it probably would feel more comfortable from it for everybody, <clears throat> but I don't know. I mean, I think uh, Bob, you and I maybe have talked about this before, but I think um, when it comes to grieving, you know, I'm just going to take that aspect of lament. Um, when you have lost or you have done something that you really regret, whatever it is, um, grief isn't one of those things where you feel it and then all of a sudden you don't feel it anymore. You know, there are triggers, there are things that happen, right? And so um, that, again, I think lends itself to the discomfort. <laughs> it's. I was going to ask the question, why do we avoid lamentation? I think we just answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with... Um, even to take a step back from the discomfort of feeling through hard stuff. There's a part of me that thinks that it's also an issue of we don't as human beings, a lot of times, especially in the busy kind of hectic lifestyle that we tend to live sometimes here in the West in, in the United States, we don't really want to do a lot of introspection and really look at what's living in us. Does that resonate? 
you all. Yep. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. If we look too hard, then we have to change something. Right. Right. We we can't stay the same anymore. Then all of a sudden we're pushed forward. If you actually see what's going on inside of you, you can't stay there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think for many people change scares them more than staying with something that is is not something that is not right and something that's not proper mm-hmm. you know how do you make a safe space for people to be able to do that change and to lament where they were mm-hmm. right and I guess that, that's where I keep going round with that so you're talking about like the idea of for somebody to really lament and feel through that stuff, they got, they need to have some, they need to have a community. There's a community aspect to it. There has to be support because the pain is mm-hmm. hard and because it's too easy for lament to, to go into self-loathing. You have to have people who help you put boundaries. Mm-hmm on it to 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 move back to that idea that we don't throw people away right Mm -hmm. we we don't throw people away the the least of us um the most vulnerable the ones that the ones who need our love the most are the ones who make us angry at them (laughs) and who Mm -hmm. hurt us and that is a order <laughs> <laughs> when i say that in class when we're talking about the six principles of nonviolence, i want you to think of 80 people looking at me and going she has lost her mind <laughs> <laughs> she has lost her mind she wants me to go love and forgive somebody from the clan or whatever and you know mm-hmm. she has lost her mind. it's it's not intuitive right Mm-mm. it's not intuitive that's not the way our brains work you know, I think, um, so, you know, there's, I, I love, um, and Salika, you've really brought it up a couple of different times already, but I love um, that focus on the relational aspect of lamentation, mm-hmm. which obviously it's really important when we're talking about race um, and lamenting racial injustices, um, systemic racism, things like that. Um I'm going to lean on Bob and Tanya a little bit here. Uh, a couple of years back, we we went through a book together called Many Colors. Um, and one of the main things that stuck out to me about that book was a uh, focus on lamentation uh, when it comes to race. Would you all, would you guys speak a little bit to um, when you think of lamentation in terms of racism, um, whether you're talking about your own personal experience of it or whatever, how what is there to lament when it comes to racial injustice, systemic racism? Um, again, I'll only speak on my part because, um, like you mentioned, I'm I'm not here for my book education. Um, I'm here for my life experience. Um, I was one of them racists. <clears throat> and having to deal with that to forgive myself, to forgive others, um, was very hard. Um, because for myself, to myself, I'm not a very forgiving person. Um, because a lot, I've done a lot of things in my life <clears throat> that a right human being won't do. Um, so it was integral in my part of my recovery, basically from that lifestyle, um, from that environment that I thrived in, um, that I didn't see that there was anything wrong with, uh, because that's what I was raised in as for, um, but it, 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 it is, if you were, trying to move forward, it is the only way to move forward um, because you'll get stuck on it. If you start beating yourself up too much about it, uh, keep thriving on it, 
um, cause I did it for many of years. Um, but through the grace of God, I, I've been, I've been set free and, uh, I don't have a problem with lamenting anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, I look forward to it because that just shows that I'm working to be a better person. And, uh, trying to show other people that they don't have to live in that lifestyle. There's, there's a better lifestyle to live. So yeah. I, uh, I want to Bob come back to more of you, get a little bit more into your story a little later in the show. Um, sure. because I think there's just, there's important, there are important details. I think it would be great for people to hear. Um, but when you're, so you're, when you talk about the relationship between or what there is to lament about race issues, you have a very personal, like, I have I have race problems in myself, racism <laughs> right. issues in myself that I've needed to lament over. Now, Tanya, I don't want to I don't want to uh, presuppose that you don't have that, but from a um, from the perspective of kind of a, maybe a, a community or social mm -hmm. viewpoint, what do you feel like there is to lament when it comes to race? What isn't there? I mean, that, that's a broad statement, I know, but there's so, racism is so interwoven in our culture and how we live our life that I think that <clears throat> for people to acknowledge what they have done as a culture, what we have done, what we have created, the power we've created and given white people, I think that's that's huge. That's huge. Um, and it takes, that's how we as a country and as a culture are going to move forward is to say, yep, this is as a as the church or as the community or politically or however, this is how we as a structure are going to go forward. We're going to say, yep, we did this. We're going to acknowledge it and we're going to go forward. We're going to grieve it and go forward. So <clears throat> how do we, and this is for everybody, um, Salika mentioned earlier about how there are pe you have people who have been hurt, been victimized by systemic racism, racism in general. And then you have those who either were the victimizers or benefited from the victimization um, who don't recognize that, that, that they're in that position. They don't recognize what they've either done explicitly or implicitly. Um, what? Um, I guess let me frame it up like this: How do we how do we help people see what you were just talking about, Tanya? How do we help? Because there can be no lament unless you recognize what's really there, right? Mm -hmm. So. That the problem you can't lament if you don't understand you did something wrong mm -hmm. right right and people are so appalled to admit that they could have either implicit bias mm -hmm. or outright racism that they won't admit it mm -hmm. i would rather have someone admit it to me and say i'm trying to do better yes I'm working on this. I know I have it. I'm trying to do better. Mm -hmm. um, then have somebody stand in front of me who is doing these uh, these acts, who 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 is ignoring my humanity and saying I'm not a racist. Because the minute they say I'm not a racist, they can't face it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say as a black person, we are not exempt from racism. <laughs> we are absolutely not exempt from racism. I've gotten myself in a lot of trouble around the university for a while saying black people can be racist too because racism is prejudice plus power. Mm -hmm. So a black person who has power can be prejudiced and can act it out. Mm -hmm. I always said the rules at the university apply to me too. I too have to watch what I'm doing when I'm in my room of white students because I have power. Hmm. And I'm also sorry to say I have some relatives who, who are racist. 
and it has been a hard journey with them. Whether it has been racism against white people or against Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And there are some black people who are prejudiced against mm -hmm. other black people. Mm -hmm. I and for me to say that and to say that it makes me ashamed of those people who should know better is something that I have to do and to, to remind myself because I don't want to get into the victim mindset that I am always the victimizer. Mm -hmm. Once you get into that mindset that you have no agency, that's when you start victimizing people. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need lament because lament is what keeps us from going there and doing those things that justify hurting people, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think lament keeps us humble. It keeps us grounded and I'm human. I made a mistake too. Like thinking of what you were saying, Salika, as an Asian woman, the part of my journey in the past year has been about how did how have Asians contributed to racism across the country, and how how am I then responsible for that? Right? How how did I play implicitly or explicitly play a role in that? Because up until recently, I, that wasn't something that I was completely aware of. Like I should be being adopted. That's not what I was raised in. I didn't know. I knew the white culture. I knew the white racism. Like, but I didn't know how um, Asians had come alongside white people and suppressed black people throughout the years. And so that's one of the things that I have had to acknowledge and lament in the past year. I, um, I feel like it's time for my weekly PSA where I talk about how I think all of us have racist tendencies. Um, because, uh, and I think it's a human nature thing. I think it's a, uh, um, long before I knew anything about implicit bias or anything like that, um, I, I knew what I had read in the Bible and what I had experienced personally, that we we're all going to look out for ourselves if left to our own devices, and mm -hmm. that we are um, always going to be drawn to people who look like us and think like us and talk like us, because it makes us feel better about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um and so when when like when Salika talks about, you know, there are black people who are racist. I'm like, yeah, of course, because everybody's racist. I mean, at the, at the core, all of us have some of that in us, mm -hmm. I think is what I'm trying to get at. And um, when I think about how do we help people, including ourselves, um, get to a place where we're ready to lament some of these things, maybe one of the first steps is that recognition that we all have these tendencies living in us mm -hmm. to be drawn to people who look like us and such. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, I'm not going to say it's in our brain chemistry because there is no gene right. that makes us racist. There is no gene switch that makes us racist, but our cultures uh, the way we interact with the world creates these patterns in our brains. Mm -hmm. no. And when we are fearful, when we're in fight or flight, we go back to the base patterns mm -hmm. that our cultures have put in our brains. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's when we move into that fight, flight, fear. And that's when we're most likely to stereotype. That's when we're most likely to dehumanize, uh, you know, fear, fear and comfort, fear and comfort are hooks for all sorts of viciousness. Mm -hmm. And um, I think facing them is very hard. No one really wants to face the fact that they're afraid, especially men in our culture, men are taught that to be afraid is to be less than masculine. Mm -hmm. We don't open room for men to talk about this. And we act as if racism is an individual failing instead of sometimes as a cultural 
what, what you said about being surrounded by people who didn't know better. Mm -hmm. who normalize the racism, who normalize the ideas. I mean, I'm seeing it now. I'm seeing it now among people who will engage in the ugliest and nastiest of behaviors. And then they, they say, but I'm not a racist. <laughs> You know, that, that makes it so hard. I think facing ourselves is the hardest thing we do. And and, and going into that beating and self-loathing that you talked about is the hardest thing we do. Yeah. We're just, you know, fragile, messed up human beings, aren't we? <laughs> I don't know about fragile. I'm not fragile. I don't know. I mean, I think about when I think about fragile, the reason I use that word is um, I'm thinking about the dynamic of, OK, <clears throat> I have acted in or um, been OK with racist dynamics around me or I've done racist things or thought racist things or whatever. And then so I'm going to lament those things and feel through that. But then oh, it, it might not be too long before it's, oh, woe is me because I'm such a mess. And and then you lose sight on what this is all about. You know, it's then it becomes about you again. Mm -hmm. um, we're just, we're interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> At least that gets us to the FCC. There's other ways to put it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I think maybe what would make sense is um, I think what sometimes people just need to hear stories, right? Mm -hmm. Like people need to hear uh, mm -hmm. of, you know, like one person, their journey going through stuff. And I intend on sharing a little bit of my story. And I, I, I like I said before, I want to reach into Bob's story a little bit, too, here. Um, but before I do that, I want to take a moment and just reintroduce the panel in case anybody's joined us here in the last little bit. Uh, this is Conversations in Color, and we're talking about lamenting racial injustice and how important that is. And our guests this week are uh, Tanya Hughes, who is a licensed counselor with the Clinic for Christian Counseling. Um, and then we have Bob Sunderland, who is his main qualification is he's my buddy and I know his story and it's a cool story. <laughs> Plus, he's got a sweet beard. Um, and then, obviously, we have uh, Dr. Salika Duxworth Lawton. Um, once again, she is UW Eau Claire professor and the president of Uniting Bridges and um, a general pain in the butt like me. So, uh, <laughs> we also have uh, helping us out tonight, we have Adam Akala, who is monitoring our community engagement. Hey, Adam, I just wanted to check in with you. You want to remind everybody how they can connect with us here? Yeah, if you have any questions for us, feel free to drop them in the chat here in Paragon. Um, this is a really important part of our um, experience here is getting community questions and being able to answer them as a panel. So feel free to drop them in that chat box right there, and we'll we'll be sure to intersperse them into the conversation. We've got at least one here, but we'll um, we'll come to it whenever we've got a little bit of time with the panel. Sounds good. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate it. Um, so let's uh, let's let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about your story, Bob, and then I'm going to talk about mine too. And the reason I kind of want to hold these up uh, in two separate. Um, uh, is separate things is because your story will sound more extreme to a lot of people. My story won't sound as extreme. And there's purpose in talking about kind of both ends of that spectrum a little bit, even though I don't know that we're in both ends of the spectrum, but you know what I mean. Right. Um, so, Bob, I know that, uh, you know, we, we've talked at length about your background and, and we've we've talked about some deep stuff together. Would you talk a little bit about um you don't have to go too in depth, but the household you were raised in and you took, you know, your connection with uh, racist community. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so to begin with my, 
Uh, my childhood basically was just nothing but uh, extreme violence towards me. Um, I had a stepfather that uh, used me as his human punching bag on a daily basis. Um, to point out one instance, uh, four years in the seventh grade and never a day in the eighth grade because of the abuse that I would entail every day um, from welts from my neck to my ankles. Um, he is the only person in my fighting career <laughs> uh, that I ever broke a bone in my body. Um, he was in a very well-known biker group, um, riddled with a lot of uh, Aryan nation, um, skinheads, supremacists of all kinds. Um, and yes, there are African-American um, racists, there are Hispanic racists, there are Asian racists, everybody, every culture, there is very extreme racism in it. Um, mine ended me up into prison a couple times. Um, um, yeah, we just really wasn't a very good person. Um, I, I really don't know what more to say, um, <laughs> but I thrived in violence. Um, I took what I wanted. Um, didn't matter uh, what it took. Um, but yeah. So uh, you said you, you know, you're, you're the household you're raising. Your dad was a part of this biker gang. Yep. Um, Not a gang. You, it's a club. A club. Okay. Sorry. Um, did you, you know, you talked about the, the violence that you lived out as, as you grew up. Did, were you a part of that group as well? I mean. No, I was not a, what they would call a patched member. I was grandfathered in um, because of who my dad was or who my stepdad was. Um, he was a very high ranking official in the club. Um, so I got a lot of benefits to say. Um, there was a lot of installed fear of me right away because of who my dad was. And I took, well, I took a lot of advantage of it. Um, but I also learned how to install the fear myself. Um, and when I say fear, um, I was always taking, there was never any giving of any kind. I had no love for anybody. Yeah. Which is really weird for me to think about <laughs> as I know you now. <laughs> Um, now you, you talked about that, um, that club, what there were connections with, um, Aryan nation and, and, uh, skinheads and all that kind of stuff. Is that the philosophy that was underneath that? Did you get into that at all? I did. I, um, my first stint going to prison, um, the bike club doesn't exist behind the prison walls. Most of them run right with the uh, Aryan Nation or um, prison is a very racist place. And it doesn't matter if you're in this club, in any motorcycle club, you run with your skin. Um, if you're white, you run with the whites. If you're black, you run with black. If you're brown, you run with brown. If you're yellow, you run with yellow. Um, because if you don't, um, there's a bullet, there's a, there's a bullseye put on you right away, um, mostly from your own club. Um, so yeah, I, I took part in it a lot. I, I, a lot of group violence. Um, I wouldn't call them riots because it was mostly one-sided. Um, so there, yeah. Yeah. That's about as far as I want to go there. I, I understand. Um, and I want to tell you how much I appreciate you even sharing what you've shared. Um, cause it's not like, I know it's not super comfortable for you to talk about. Um, no. but, um, <clears throat> so you, you have, um, I just kind of want to summarize a little bit and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but you and in, in your past had engaged actively in, um, uh, race, racist violence. Um, and, and so, you know, when I, when I talk about, kind of the extreme that's most people can't relate to that. Most people, yeah. you know, weren't a part of a club that would be involved in that kind of philosophy necessarily, at least overtly. Um, right. And not everybody goes, you know, goes to jail and goes to prison. And so like, not everybody can relate to that. Um, 
before we before we kind of give the contrast of my story, I would ask you um, when like what was the what was the the kind of the the turning point for you where you're like, wait a second, none of that's I should have done any of that stuff. And I'm speaking specifically about the race related stuff that you were involved with. When was that moment for you and, and how did that start to shift for you? Um, to be 100% honest, it's when I gave my life to Christ. Um, I started valuing every person. I started seeing them as another human being, not less than, but equal. Um, they bleed just like I bleed. And uh <clears throat> It was really working with the people that cared for me. Um, you, Tanya, some other people that I know um, that pursued me because you seen where my heart really was, even though I didn't. Um, but it, 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 it was it was no aha moment. It was more of a relieving moment mm. um, because that was a heavy weight all my life. Um, uh, because there's a facade, you know, um, every, uh, given the right person to talk to every racist person has a good heart and it can be brought out of them. Um, it just needs to be encouraged out of them. Uh, like you say that there's racist tendencies in everybody, but there's also loving tendencies in everybody. Mm. Um, and I'm a firm believer in that. And through my friendship with people that believed that wholeheartedly, they, they revealed my loving heart. Um, and, and I just, you know, there's things that I see nowadays that makes me want to puke. And I wouldn't even have thought twice about it before. I probably would have giggled, you know, um, TVs, movie shows that they glamorize it and this and that, and it's revolting. And um, that's not the person I want to be anymore. Yeah. And it, you and I have had the opportunity to attend churches in the area that yeah. are not primarily white, which was a fun experience. Right. We went, right. visited the Hmong Christian Church together and we visited uh, the um, Christ Apostolic Temple Church um, once or twice, I, I think. Um, yep. And uh, that was cool. I know that a little bit, yeah, I kind of had to drag you into that because you weren't. <laughs> I wasn't feeling very good about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good thing we did that together. I mean, it was a privilege. It was a blessing. Yeah. Um, thank you again, Bob, for sharing some of that stuff. I know it's not easy. Um, and, and, and as long as people learn something from it, man, I'm all good. So uh, I know Salika has been itching, I think, to, to talk to you, Bob, because she knew a little bit about your story. But now she's heard a little bit more. So I'd, I'd love to hear what Salika thinks. You know, it, it's interesting because this whole heart of MLK's philosophy is reconciliation. Mm -hmm. But right now on one side of me are white people who will not admit that they're racist. And on the other side of me are some very angry multicultural people who feel victimized and they think once a racist, always a racist. Mm -hmm. And I think they need to hear that hearts can change. Mm -hmm. Because it's very easy to just write someone off who hates you. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say, why should I have to put myself out? This is killing my energy. And there's, to be honest, there's a lot of people in the anti-racist community who would say it's not, that we shouldn't have to do that. But there's still people in my community, and I'm a black Southerner. I helped to integrate my school. Mm. So that was back in the 70s. I've seen all sorts of things. I've seen David Duke. I have, we, we had the Vietnamese uh, boat people come into our schools in the late 70s. And as you can imagine, the racial fights were horrific. And I come from a city 
where the Klan would parade up and down Highway 90 with their hoods up and with arms. So I have students sometimes who ask me, why will I put my hand out to people who they see as racist against them? Why will I try to talk to them? When you are in your racist phase, if I had offered you water, would you have taken it? No, ma'am. I would not even have acknowledged you. And see, it's ironic because we had protests that ended at the courthouse and I was running the security and the medic part of it. And we had a bike group over there. Um, and they were with a group of people who were, of course, they were against any protest of the police or anything. I was the only black person in the parking lot. And they thought we were going to burn the courthouse down. Yeah, and they thought we were going to burn the courthouse down. <laughs> laughing about that one. Uh, and there are still people to this day who think I'm insane because I went over there and talked to them. <laughs> and I will say three people did look at me and peel out the parking lot. And I did offer water to one man and he did not acknowledge me. He just gunned his motor and left. Is it important, though, for me to still try? But I'm sorry you had to experience that. Thank you for that. But is it worth it to keep trying? I mean, at some point, it feels like I know this history of army integration. For many of the people in the army, the white men in the army, they had never been around black men before. And it was being in combat and living with them that helped to attack those beliefs that they had. But we can't go jam people up on a battlefield right now. That's not really a good way to try to get rid of racism. Why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do not recommend it. Getting shot at is <laughs> not a good thing. You know, what could a black person have done that would have moved you? To thinking of back when I was in that realm, honestly, I was, I was, yeah, nothing. Um, and that's sad. Um, yeah. But that's how important our white allies are, and that's how important for our white allies to have compassion. Mm -hmm. Yes. And to keep the connections up on. Does that make sense? 100. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You bet. <laughs> I was thinking the very, I was, th is, is act actually, I was thinking the same thing, Salika, when Bob was mentioning, like, he, like, there's nothing you could have done. I'm like, well, I wonder, <clears throat> you know, could, could, if, if I could have been the bridge, you know, during that time in your life, or somebody who looks like me could have been the bridge. Nope. Um, and see, I think we do need whites to be the white. There are some white people that somebody black could maybe reach. Right. I'm thinking of the black musician who goes to Klan rallies to try to redeem. Mm -hmm. More power to him scares the heck out of me. I think <laughs> we, we pushed me outside of my comfort zone. I'm not going to a Klan rally. A bunch of bikers, I can survive. <laughs> my husband still thinks I'm insane. You might be a little bit. Yeah. I probably will, but you know but what? They took water and they hugged me and they wanted to tell me they weren't racist and they didn't want me to stereotype. Sorry, I got to throw food at my dog so my dog doesn't <laughs> bark. So That's I'm, right. I'm throwing doggy biscuits at the dog. <laughs> um, but, you know, I also, I sometimes think our white allies need to hear this more than us, because it's very easy for them to write off. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Um, 
So let, let's take a moment. I know we've got um, we've got some engagement from the community here, and I want to get into that here in just a minute. Um, before I do, I want to just share briefly my story because um, I don't. I was never a part of a mic, motorcycle club, a bike club um, that that you know was white supremacist white supremacist uh, oriented. I, I I don't have anything like that in my story. Um, <laughs> Have any? I've never perpetrated, personally perpetrated any racially motivated violence on anybody. In fact, I'm not 100 percent sure I've done any <laughs> violence to anybody on purpose. Um, and so my story is more of I was raised in a in a community and amongst a family um, who extended family, especially who where there was racist language and attitudes around me. However, when I was a teenager, I rebelled against that. And because it, to me, as I started to under, as I got serious about my faith, um, to me, it didn't, those things didn't coincide. It couldn't, they didn't work together. But I, what I, what's interesting about that is I still, um, when I look back, I can, I see certain things that I did or said or thought more importantly, that, 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 betrayed the racism that was living in my heart at the time. And um, probably the best example would be in my, you know, in my adult years, uh, up until five years ago or something like that, um, I had a really hard time understanding uh, the, the cries from the black community about police brutality, especially in cities, in bigger cities. Um, the racism that I knew about that were in the more rural areas, especially in the South, like I was familiar with that. I knew what that looked like. Um, but I had never personally seen that kind of police brutality that I would hear people talking about. And so there was this in the back of my mind, I had this thought of, well, they must have deserved it, whatever it was on some level, or they're exaggerating or whatever. Um and it wasn't until I started seeing videos and pictures um, of these things happening that I'm like, oh, they this is real. Like, and this is as the father of a black son, you know, I'd already been his dad for a few years before I really started understanding more of what was actually happening in cities. Um, and so I had to, I mean, to use the biblical word, I don't know a better word, I had to repent. Like I had to just and I had to lament. I had to feel through the fact that I had been ignoring the the cries of my brothers and sisters in in places in contexts that I didn't know, um, who were experiencing things I had never seen. But it's obvious that they are experiencing these things. Um, and my suspicion is that in our audience, in people who may listen to this down the road, you know, may watch this video down the road. Um, there may be a few people who are going to be able to better relate to Bob's story and the the, the way he was raised and, and that influence and the violence and all that. But I, my, my guess is there's a lot of people who can relate, a lot more people, white people, that can probably relate to the story of this, you know, this good white kid who, you know, well, doesn't have that background. And right. I would argue... I think a case can be made that people that are in my position who don't recognize the privilege that we live with, don't recognize the benefits that we've received because of systemic racism, we might actually be more dangerous than mm -hmm. people from your background. So I say all that to say um, us opening our eyes to the realities of systemic racism, us opening up our eyes to the experiences of people of color in this country, um, the inequities that are there, and then lamenting those things, even if we haven't directly done anything to anybody, but lamenting them from a societal on a societal level and lamenting the fact that I've benefited from this. Um, it's key. Uh, and we could we could dive into that a lot more, but um, we don't have a ton of time for that. Tanya, I'm curious because we haven't heard from you in a little bit. Um, what what are you thinking right now? You know, all these things that we've talked about from either a counseling perspective or from a um, from an Asian woman, Asian American woman perspective. 
what's what are you thinking? I think I mean I could talk from from both perspectives, but I think from a counseling perspective, like we're right on. We have to heal. We have to go forward. Acknowledge our <laughs> our failures. Acknowledge our wrongdoing and go forward. And I think you're right, Ed, that there are a lot more people who are in your shoes who have experienced things, who have not experienced, who have committed racist, use their implicit bias, all of our implicit bias to, um, for ben their own benefit. And it's acknowledging that that will help us go forward as an Asian woman, you know, Asian skin is much closer to white skin, right? My skin color is much closer to your color skin. And so there is, there's, I mean, what I keep going back to is that power differential, right? The light, the closer you are to white, the more power you have yeah. when it comes to racism. And so how, how have I how do how do as how does the Asian culture begin to lament that fully? How do we lament that even more fully so that we can be better allies? All right. I think we have a question from the community and I think it's time to to start diving into that. Adam, would you let us know what's up? Yeah, sure. So I'm I'm first of all, I just want to say this has been an amazing conversation and I thank you all for being so vulnerable and so willing to share both personal stories and experiences uh, for our audience. So I, I know that our audience definitely appreciates this tonight as well. Uh, question from Janet on privilege. Um, so we brought up privilege in the last um, little bit here. A lot of people are recognizing their privilege and now see inequities in it, but it's hard to give up those privileges. Um, Many are, though, ready to somehow share advantages and opportunities. So what are some small, specific steps that we can take to start sharing those with, with our wider community? Um, and this, this kind of ties back into what we were just talking about, about recognizing that privilege in the first place, lamenting it, and then moving forward. So what are some actionable items that we can get to move from the current privilege through lament to action? To have to see our privilege, we, we have to be willing to face ourselves. I mean, I'm a black woman, but I'm a medium to light skinned black woman, depends on when I have the tan. <laughs> <laughs> Highly educated. And in this country, in certain areas and in certain geographies that does give me privilege mm -hmm. and to look in the mirror and admit that um, it requires some soul searching and it requires some willingness to have some people around you who will not let you get away mm. mm -hmm. yeah. with your stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> The, 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 yeah. the term, there, there's a friend of mine in San Diego, Lace on Race, uh, and, and she she says to call in with care, to call in with love, hmm. not to call out to to humiliate, but to call in. Have you thought? I mean, this is where language gets us. Have you thought about how you can do that and someone else can't? Mm. Have you thought? Have you seen? So that it's, it's kind of like Gottman and it's not an attack. Because when people feel attacked, they, they, the first thing they do is go into that defensive mode. Yeah. But, but for me to, to tell students to try to get them to think about what it means to be in a situation where the corruption around you undermines your ability to engage in your rights. So, and sometimes I use the word corruption instead of systematic racism. Mm. For a lot of whites in Eau Claire, they know what corruption means. <laughs> And they can see how corruption violates your ability to get out, especially poor whites. 
Whereas systematic racism, they they can't, I don't know, something about the word just creates a block. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The minute I say governmental corruption, the minute I say disparate impact, the, the, the minute I say politicians trying to mess people over, <laughs> they know what those words be. <laughs> and it's yeah, and I, I know every activist who say, well, we should be able to say systematic racism. Yeah, but our, I can be right or I can reach somebody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I need to yep. reach somebody. Yeah. I think uh, just to kind of add on to, I think honestly the most important step that I can think of in terms of using the privilege that I have um, is to be the bridge where um, Salika wouldn't be welcome, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, there, there are just there are things that I can say as a white male that Salika, if she were to say the same thing to a certain audience, would be totally shut down right away, and nobody would listen to her. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing with Tanya. Honestly, I mean, it's the same dynamic. Um, as a white male, I have that kind of privilege, and so I think for me. Um, and, and this is one of those things when we've talked about uh, the current, this current iteration of the civil rights movement that we're in now. Um, there's a lot that has been said about letting uh, black community members be the voices of it all. I appreciate that and I get it, but I also think that there are people who won't listen to them. And that's where people like me and Bob where we come in and we it's imperative that we're using our voices to speak on behalf of our uh, our brothers and sisters who are people of color. Um, and so I think to me, uh, leaning in on um, use that's to me using your privilege to build bridges to other people who would not necessarily listen to a person of color. I think that's one of the, the primary ways that you can you can lever your privilege. And I can be mad about the fact that they won't listen to me, but that's not going to fix the situation. Yeah. <laughs> if I work pragmatically with it, I can get them to move to maybe where they will listen to me. Mm-hmm. Right. But I'm not going to say it doesn't hurt that that's what I have to do. Right. Mm-hmm. It's messed up. Mm-hmm. But, it, but I, you know, if it helps any, any, any at all, I, I say, use me. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I, I want to be used in that way. As much as it needs to be until we don't need that anymore. So um, I, I also wanted to mention, too, that when it comes to privilege, um, uh, one thing that Salika said earlier that I think inspired this thought for me is she talked about how um, you can ask, what are some things that you can do that this person wouldn't be able to do? Like I think about, um, I've talked about this before in this, in this venue of how, um, uh, how different the experience is for me to get pulled over by the police versus a black man's experience being pulled over by police. Uh, And just in terms of the emotional reaction when it first happens, when you first see the lights. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the more you can draw those comparisons, and I think even like thinking about things like this, um, talking about how black people are two and a half to three times more likely to be killed by police than white people. You talk about the disproportionate um, amount of black folks that are incarcerated compared to the population in general. Um, and if you walk down the logical progression of those things, so why is it that that's the case? Well, they're committing more crimes. Well, are they, or are they over-policed or are they are, are there dynamics in play that we're not seeing? I think ultimately the question comes down to, mm-hmm. do you think that they are somehow more depraved than white people that somehow they're more, they're defective? Mm that that's the reason why. 
And the, I think the more you can drill down into things like that and get at the heart of the issue as to why somebody can feel like it's okay that two and a half to three times is two and a half to three times more likely that a black person is going to be killed by the police, that, that they are incarcerated at this insane rate compared to white people, um, proportionally speaking. Um, and you really dive down into the heart of it and see why people can live with that and be okay with it. That's the kind, those are the kinds of conversations where you can lever your privilege to affect some, some real change, I think, especially with people who think that way, who are, who are logical thinkers that you can walk through with that. So Adam, do you have anything else? I do. We've actually got some really, really great questions coming up here. Um, so the next one up is how do you actively combat the racism that you used to support? And do you have any tips for a fellow recovered racist? Yeah, Bob, I'm going to defer to you on this one because I think this was mostly uh, Well, um, how to combat it, don't encourage it um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, my advice to you as a recovering racist, um, keep on keeping on. Um, uh, only you can do it. Um, and it has to be wholeheartedly, um, nothing in life that matters can be done half-heartedly. That's. Yeah. So let uh, me ask you, Bob, cause I know a little bit of, you know, some of the things you've been involved with, cause I've done some of it with you. What are the, some of the things that you've engaged with over the last couple of years that you feel like have, combated racism at large or combated racism in you? Um, learning. Um, I've, I, uh, one of the main things that somebody has told me that has stuck with me is listen to understand and learn, not to respond and react. Because um, once you start listening, when you start to respond or react, you've stopped listening. Um, you stopped caring for the other person. Um, my biggest things is, uh, that I've done was through my church, through small groups. Um, there's a beautiful group out. It's called be the bridge. Um, it, it's, it's helped me dramatically. Uh, it's by, I'm going to plug her Letitia Morrison. Um, she's the author of the book, great book, great small group study. Um, and I encourage you just to, uh, get involved, uh, some way, shape, or form on the opposite end of racism, on how to combat it, how to reconcile, um, get to know another culture. Um, that's been my favorite thing is getting to know the Hmong culture, um, the African-American culture, because the I'm not going to try to say the name of the church that you said a while ago, um, but it's on Omaha, right down the road from my house. Um, <laughs> I love walking by there after church on Sunday. It's beautiful sounds coming from there. Um, it, uh, racism isn't a hard addiction to beat, just so you know. Um, it's a very easy addiction to beat. Um, you just follow your heart and uh, do the next right thing. Um, that's my biggest advice to anybody. Do the next right thing. Because we all, as grown adults, we know right from wrong. Whether we want to admit it or not, we know right from wrong. All right. What's next, Adam? Uh, the next question that I have is from Randy, and he's asking, and maybe Tanya, maybe you could speak to this um, from your own experiences. How do we lament the generational racism that we were brought up with? Mm. Mm, it's a good one. I think it, um, some of it's acknowledging it like I, and calling it out. Like I remember distinctly a telephone call with my dad, and he, I'm not going, not defending him, but he grew up in St. Paul, the midway area of St. Paul, Minnesota, during the time when a um, the Laotians came to that area. Well, one day he said, yeah, I got to clean something. I got to get this mung out of here. He wouldn't mind me telling this story. So he, I, I, we finished the conversation. We hung up the phone and it didn't sit right. So I picked it up and I called my dad back and I said, dad, do you know what you just said? So it's called, and he, he like was mad and he hung up on me. 10 minutes later, he's like, he calls me back. He's like, yeah. I shouldn't have done that. That was bad. Thanks for calling me out. But it's it's calling it out. It's saying, hey, mm -hmm. it's lamenting that. It's saying that's wrong. Acknowledging that's wrong. 
and then calling it out. And I also think it's just, it's acknowledged. It starts with acknowledging it. Here's where it starts, right? Like, um, one thing after another leads to another leads to another and you acknowledge and then you're set free. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to go first, right? I mean, right. if you're going to break a generational pattern, right. somebody's got to be the pioneer. Mm -hmm. You bet. You know? um, I still remember going, um, we had a family camping trip down in North Carolina years and years ago. Um, and one of my relatives uh, made a comment about um, I was riding in the golf cart with them. They had a golf course there at this camp, this camping area. Um, and he made a comment about this uh, black man and a white man were on the one of the putting greens together. And he didn't like that. You know, they shouldn't be together. And um, and I remember that led to some hearty mm -hmm. <laughs> conversation. Um, and it was just, it was one of those, it's one of those uh, kind of defining moments for me, you know, cause I, I said something about it. I didn't, you know, I, I don't think of it as I had the courage to say something. I didn't feel like I had to be afraid to say something about it. I just felt like the, like, that's dumb. Let's, why do you talk like that? And, mm -hmm. um, but there's, you, they're just there. Somebody's gotta, somebody's gotta go first. Somebody's gotta mm -hmm. have the courage to confront the stuff. You know, um, and to to make the choice to live differently. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about confronting what you hear from the family members. It's also I've seen this way of life. This is not the right way for me to live, and I'm gonna choose something different. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I think one of the things, Bob, that you we that you've done um, in terms of combating racism is that you've you've worked on building bridges. You've worked mm -hmm. on connecting with people like you alluded to this, but people who are different than you. Um, and that is to me, I'm not sure that there's anything more powerful in combating racism than connecting with people who are mm -hmm. different than you um, mm -hmm. and really building relationships and just seeing them as people and not mm -hmm. as black person, Asian person, but like mm -hmm. a real person who has, the same struggles and issues, you know, that you right. might have and, and they're trying to pay their bills and their kids are a pain in the butt and mm -hmm. all this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yep. yeah. Adam, do you have anything else for us? The, the final question was about um, how do you work with your family? And I think we kind of encompassed that with this last uh, discussion thread. Um, how do you recommend going about standing up against racism with your family slash community? So much of my family is racist and refuses to acknowledge their privilege, and it's so difficult to respect them when they cannot respect people of color. And I think Janet, in summing up what Bob said earlier, do the next right thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's really great advice in in calling them in, bringing them in, and talking to them rather than calling them out to try to make them feel embarrassed, call them in to try to have a conversation. Yep. Yep. You, you can set boundaries and you, there's some phrases you can use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they say something really awful, you, you look at them and say, did you really mean that to sound that way? I didn't mm -hmm. think that was you. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound like you. Mm -hmm. Is that really what you meant it to sound like? Here's what I heard you say. Is that what you meant to say? Right. And if they do that thing here, which got our kids in trouble with the Snapchat incident, if they're using the N-word or other slurs, point out to them that, you know, you use the slur in the background, you're going to lose it in the front ground, and people mm -hmm. are going to be racist. Mm -hmm. Is that really what you want people to think you are? Is this really who you're going to be? Right. You know, and there's something powerful about a child telling a parent, I respect you so much. How can you, do you really want to sound like that? Mm -hmm. I, 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 that hurts me when you do that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to set boundaries. I have, a, like I said, I have a couple of relatives. I've thrown one off a Facebook page. He'll survive. <laughs> <laughs> He's still mad. It'll get. He'll get over it. Um, 
you set boundaries. If mm-hmm. they're going to say that in front of you and you're a grown adult and you're paying your bills, you walk out. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're still living at home, one one thing to work to get out of the house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but leave the room. Mm-hmm. Leave the room. Yes. Make it clear they can have their ugliness or they can have your mm-hmm. pride. Yeah. Because they need to love you more than they love this ugliness, especially if you have mm-hmm. a child. You know, it breaks my heart when I have students who are biracial who come in and say their parents put up with all this ugly commentary to keep the peace. And it's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. peace like that, you aren't keeping peace. That's not peace. No, no, it's not. Nope. Come back and it bites you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you you can do it in a way that doesn't humiliate them. Mm-hmm. You know, and again, this is where I, I say, you know, look at some of the Gottman books, because even though they're meant for marriage, mm. they're really good at what's called that soft send up where you're talking to people, but you're not moving them into a defensive mode. Mm-hmm. So it's almost um, like verbal Aikido. Mm-hmm. Because the minute <laughs> they stop listening. Yeah. And and it, it's you know there's also this I think and you got to keep your voice low keep your voice mm-hmm. calm it's called complementary osmosis if your voice goes up their voice goes up next thing you know you're throwing mashed potatoes at Uncle Judge. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you got to keep your voice low. Yep, I've been learning too about uh, I've been learning about motivational interviewing of mm-hmm. late for my job and. Um, And I realized that some of the stuff that we're learning is stuff that I just over the years have developed from conversations with people and Mm -hmm. the idea of mutual exploration and and just asking questions of, okay, so you said this, you know, what what did you mean by that? Mm -hmm. And rather than it being like, why did you say that? You know, what did you mean? I I just want to make sure I understand Mm -hmm. what's happening. Um, I can and I can say, you know, like I had people that relatives that were really, really close to me um, that I had to break off the relationship for a while with. The, and the main reason was because the racism was there and I've got a black son and I'm just not going to have that. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to hear it. And I certainly am not going to let him hear it from mm-hmm. these people who are close to me. And so. um we went for several years without talking and it was just uh, when we started making the effort to try to reconnect, the very first thing they had to do was I actually sent them a little video where I was saying, okay, so here's the thing. If we're going to have a conversation and we're going to start into this, you need to know this and you need to know I'm not going to tolerate any of that kind of talk. Mm-hmm. And, and then I actually even then sent them some links to some of the stuff I've written on my blog about race and stuff, because it's like, you got to know going into this, this is where I'm coming from. Mm-hmm. And so we had those boundaries set up and that relationship has been restored. I mean, it's not, we're not as close as we were before, but we are talking on a regular basis and mm-hmm. it's been good conversations and there are things we can't talk about because uh, if we do, it's not going to go well. And I think we all know that. So we just don't talk about those things. Um. But when we talk about things like Ed being in all these protests in Eau Claire and like, you know, <laughs> it's like I talk about it and they're like, well, you know, just be safe. And I'm like, well, the risk is worth it. The cause is worth the risk. So if there's any risk, I don't. It's OK. I know that. And I, I'm, and so like they know where I stand on things. They know. But they don't like we don't intentionally lean in on a lot of those topics because we know they're not going to go anywhere good. So it can be done. Having those kind of boundaries, we can do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard, but um, it can certainly be done. Um, I'm trying to tell certain of my relatives we're not going to discuss that today. Right. Right. (laughs) Yes. Yep. Just let that go. We're not discussing it today. Yep. Yeah. Because there are sometimes people want to start a fight. Mm-hmm. They want to pick a fight. They want to dominate. I mean, it, it mm-hmm. really comes into that dominating. 
and, and for us to remember our power and to say, you know, I'm grown and I pay my bills. I don't have to engage this fight today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah um, Man, I'm, I'm so encouraged by this conversation. Um, it's just, uh, this is, I, it, full disclosure, this is an episode I've been looking forward to for a long time um, because I knew we get to hear some of Bob's story and I know what the, the kind of changes that Bob's gone through. And Tanya and I have walked with Bob through through some of that stuff. And, um, and Tanya has been an ally in some of this protest stuff we've been doing and so it's just, it was exciting to me to have this this group of folks together um, to talk about this. Um, I'm going to just, I want to thank the three of you for being on the show. It's 8.56, y'all. That's how quickly, wow. that's how quickly this wow. time goes. Um, but I want to thank you, Bob and Tanya, for coming on. And uh, it just means a lot to me. And we're looking forward, Tanya, to having you back in December. Um, and then Salika, as always, thank you for your wisdom and partnership um, with this and with everything else we're working on here in town. So thank you all very much. Um, I want to share kind of some closing thoughts here. Um, and then I'm going to actually in a moment hand it over to Adam to close up the show for good. Well, for tonight anyway. Um so I was, uh, I, I was addicted. I had an addiction in my life for 20 something years from the time I was about 10, uh, till the time I was 35 in that range somewhere. Um, I had an, an addiction in my life and, um, I brought that addiction into my marriage and it had a very averse impact on my marriage. As, as you can imagine, addiction for any of you who have experienced addiction, you know, it makes you self-absorbed. Um, it makes it so you have a hard time seeing what's happening around you, especially with other people. And I lived that way for a long time. I was self-absorbed and my addiction really ran my life. Um, and my wife suffered for it. In uh, 2006, um, I had people come into my life who started to call me in, if you will, on uh, some of that addictive behavior and the patterns. And I started to experience freedom. And um, and my wife was an important part of helping me find freedom. Um, but I there was this part of me, and Bob spoke to this a little bit earlier when he was talking about um, the relief that came from from getting rid of this burden of racism that he had been carrying. For me, it was the same way when I was, as I was going free, it was like all of a sudden this big burden had been lifted and I wanted to rush right into healing and joy and happiness and all this kind of stuff. And I wanted to really skip the hard stuff, which for me was lamenting how I had hurt my wife. And there, you know, there was for me as a a relation, you know, that I have a relationship with God that I needed to figure out. And I had a relationship with others that had been impacted. But that relationship with my wife had been the one that was most impacted directly by my addiction. And I wanted to skip the hard part of lamenting that and go right to, hey, we're good now. Because I just like everybody else, I hate discomfort, but I had to pause. Um, even though I didn't want to, and even though I didn't always do it very well, I had to pause and allow myself to feel that pain, to feel the regret and the grief for what I had done to my wife for those first few years of our marriage. And, um, I had to recognize the damage that I'd done to her, to our relationship. Uh, one way we've talked about it in the in the past is the idea of tallying up the bill. I had to tally up the bill for all the things I had done to her and what I owed her because of that. And I think when we talk about lamenting racism, um, mm-hmm. it's a lot about tallying up the bill of racism. What has been done to people of color? And especially when we think about black Americans and the history of of black folks, of people of African descent in America um, and what has been done to them repeatedly 
for hundreds of years. Um, thinking of tallying up that bill and then thinking about how I benefited from that as a white person. Thinking about how others have been hurt so I could benefit and, and taking a moment and pausing instead of wanting to rush right into action. Like I want to do something. I want to combat racism. I want to get out on the front lines. Taking a moment to pause and to feel the pain mm -hmm. that's associated with that bill, with all those things that have happened, with how I've benefited from it. <clears throat> and once I feel the pain and once we feel the pain, then we can start asking the questions about what can I do? Because the, the, the behavior change that you want to see long term where you're, you are <clears throat> anti-racist, living it from the inside out, comes from feeling the pain and lamenting the racism that has lived in you and around you uh, from the get go. And then we can get to work. Mm -hmm. once we get so I want to uh, once again, I want to thank Pablo Center for their great partnership with Conversations of Color. Thank you to Uniting Bridges, Converge Radio. Thanks again to these amazing panelists. I love you guys for real. Um, and it's so great to have you on here. Uh, next week, I'm really excited because we're going to do it virtually again, but we're doing uh, a focus on startup week here in Eau Claire and specifically um, people of color doing having startup businesses and startup things and how that may impact them. And with that in mind, Adam is really the spearhead, the vanguard, if you will, for this event next week. And I want to hand it over to him to close out the show. Tell us a little bit more about that and send us home tonight. So, Adam, if you would. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I'm really excited for our conversation next week. Um, next week's conversation is about entrepreneurship against the odds. Um, minorities in our communities make up about 32% of the population in the U.S., but they only account for 18% of businesses. However, over the last 10 years, minority business enterprises accounted more, for more than 50% of the 2 million new businesses started in the U.S., and they created 4.7 million jobs with an annual revenue totaling close to $700 billion. So they're a, a very, very important part of our economy. So we're going to have a conversation next week with three local entrepreneurs and business people who are, we're going to discuss um, their successes and their challenges of starting businesses here in the Chippewa Valley. We'll have Ma Vu here. We'll also have Brittany Tainter and Nabonte Wilson. So I'm really excited to talk with these three about um, the successes that they've had and the, the challenges that they've come up against and how they've overcome them here, right here in the Chippewa Valley. So um, I'm really grateful for this crew here at Conversation in Color for giving us this platform and being able to celebrate it as a part of Startup Eau Claire Week, uh, which runs next Monday through Friday. So. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for an amazing conversation as always. Um, and we will see you next Monday for Conversations in Color, Entrepreneurship Against the Odds. Thanks. <laughs>